Hello, I'm Dr. Bruce DiNardo here in the Physics Department of the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California. I would like to show you a demonstration that we do in a course on transduction. Transducers convert energy from one form to another and are essential for measuring and driving physical systems. For example, a microphone converts acoustic energy to electric energy so that we can measure or record a sound wave. The transducer in the demonstration is a good visual example that can be readily understood. It also presents problems that must be overcome, which is nearly always the case in transduction. Here is a channel of liquid with a surface wave maker at one end. The liquid is ethyl alcohol, but water can also be used. A dye called fluorescein has been added so that the surface is clearly visible. The wave maker is a wedge that is attached to a loudspeaker. Below is a function generator and an amplifier that are used to drive the loudspeaker. As I turn on and increase the gain of the amplifier, you can see that waves are being generated. The frequency is 4 hertz, or 4 cycles per second. How can the wave height be accurately measured? There are a number of ways to do this we will explain and demonstrate a homemade two-wire resistive sensor. The sensor consists of two bare wires and an electrical box. The electrical resistance between the wires decreases as the height of the liquid increases. This occurs because the liquid acts as many small parallel resistors across the wire. A greater height of liquid means more parallel resistors which spread out the electric current more and thus decrease the resistance. Applying a voltage across the wires will then yield a current that varies with the height of the liquid. By measuring the current, we should be able to detect the waves. However, there is a problem. Current is not convenient. We want to deal with voltage. We can do this by adding a fixed series resistor to the circuit. As the height of the liquid varies, the voltage across the sensor and thus the series resistor will vary. As you can see, the series resistor is the only component in the electrical box. But the box is also very convenient for cable connections. It can be shown with Ohm's law that the voltage across the series resistor varies linearly with the depth of the wires if the series resistance is chosen to be small compared to the typical resistance between the sensor wires. This is just what is desired for a sensor. For example, if the wave height doubles, the voltage doubles. Static calibration of the sensor then yields a specific number of millivolts per millimeter of the change in height of the liquid. This quantity is called the sensitivity. By measuring the voltage, we can then determine the wave height by simply dividing the voltage by the sensitivity. However, there is another problem. Use of a DC or constant voltage will lead to chemical changes, which is called electrolysis. These changes will cause a large change in the sensitivity. More importantly, one of the wires can erode over time. We thus use an AC, or sinusoidally oscillating voltage. The AC frequency is chosen to be much greater than the typical surface wave frequency. In our case, we choose 5 kilohertz, which is much greater than the 4 hertz wave frequency. Why do we choose such a relatively high frequency? The answer has to do with the fact that we now have still another problem. We need to demodulate the signal. That is, we need to remove the high-frequency carrier, as it is often called. We will then be left with what we desire, a voltage that is proportional to the wave height. The demodulation can be readily done with what is called a lock-in amplifier, which is down below. This device can accurately determine the amplitude of signal at any specific frequency, which is called the reference frequency in lock-in language. What the lock-in does is convert the signal at the reference frequency to a DC value. A low-pass filter is then used to remove the high-frequency components. For our application, the reference frequency is the carrier frequency. Also, the output will not be exactly DC, but will oscillate relatively slowly due to the waves. 
This is not a problem because the carrier has a much higher frequency. Now that the wave maker is running, let's connect the output of the lock-in amplifier to an oscilloscope. The scope is triggered off the drive to the wave maker. What you are seeing is a voltage that is proportional to the instantaneous wave height at the location of the sensor. As the drive amplitude is increased, the amplitude of the wave increases. If the drive is turned off, the waves slowly die out. Let's switch the drive back on. As the drive amplitude is decreased, the amplitude of the wave decreases. I need to increase the gain on the oscilloscope to see the wave. How small can we go and still detect the wave? This is a fundamental question in transduction. The answer depends upon the relative amount of noise in the system, which is quantified by what is called the signal-to-noise ratio. In our case, we can detect amplitudes at which the wave maker appears to be motionless to the unaided eye. If we further reduce the amplitude, we eventually see that noise starts to become important. I have turned the gain on the oscilloscope way up so that we can see the wave. The sensor is very sensitive. If I just lightly tap the table, there is a huge signal on the oscilloscope, which shows that the surface of the liquid has been disturbed. We have seen how the change in resistance across a homemade two-wire sensor can be used to detect the height of a surface wave on a liquid. This sensor is a good visual example of a transducer. Physics lecture demonstrations are fascinating, and the quest for them never ends. This is the Physics Department of the Naval Postgraduate School, and I'm Dr. Bruce DiNardo. Thank you.